Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Ann Burns from the Portsmouth Historical Society. Um, we have tonight Dr. John Conkhan, who's going to be talking to us about the conspiracy to destroy Gatsby. But before we start, can I have a little show of hands? How many people crossed the bridge to get here? Okay, four. And how? And we're and we're starting to try and just track a little more how people find out about these lectures. First of all, congratulations for signing up because it's full. Um, how did, did did you first hear about it online or in a newspaper? How many per people first saw it online? And how many people saw it in print on, in a newspaper? Portsmouth Times. The Portsmouth Times. And how did the rest of you hear about it? Newport this week. Newport this week. The door of the library. Door the library. Library. Out, this week. Out, out here. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very, very much. Um, how many? We are. How many are members of the historical society? Well, we have a question in the back. How many of you are already members of the historical society? And if not, of course, we'd love for you to join and also to support our wonderful uh, Portsmouth Library, who hosts um, lectures with us, so that we have a nice, comfortable. Snow free parking lot, heat on in the building because our museum, as you know, the second floor um, is not heated right now, so it's a perfect spot for us to be able to provide some very interesting history for all of us to do. Um, the, we are videotaping this event in the back there. It will be sh we'll, there will be a link on the Portsmouth Historical Society uh, webpage in about a week that will link it to YouTube. So if you want, you want to see it again, and it's also on Cox Channel 17 and 18. Um, and without further ado, we have Dr. Con Cannon, who will be introducing himself as part of his presentation. Thank you. I think what she's trying to say about all these warnings is don't pick your nose on camera. <laughs> all right, so don't do that if you're in camera view. Can we have the lights turned down a little bit? Okay, good. That works out well. And I am going to... Uh, talk about the conspiracy to burn the Gatsby. Well, that doesn't work, but this does. So, I uh, understand that, uh, as Brown University always says, I have no financial conflicts to uh, expose. And you have to understand that I'm not formally trained as a pediatrician, although I did take a lot of history courses at PC when I went there. Uh, I'm not formally trained as a historian, but no one really has to be. I mean, it's, there are no academic credentials that specifically say that you have to be a historian, and most people that give talks are actually amateur historians. They give talks out of passion, and that's what I'm doing here. And I have no academic reputation at stake for this, maybe in medicine, but not in history. And so I'm not research, uh, constrained by, uh, by academic uh, constraints and uh, allow to focus entirely on the Gatsby Day affair or Gatsby affair. I do this stuff because I enjoy it. Now you should all know that the Gatsby Days Committee over on the West Bay is not only a historical organization, it's a celebratory organization uh, because we party. We party a lot and it's like the Bristol Parade that you all know, only we're better. <laughs> and uh, of course, we party along with George Washington, who actually attended fireworks for the celebration of the burning of the Gatsby two years later in Williamsburg. And he paid three shillings and nine pence to see the fireworks. That's actually in the history books. Uh, so, you know, that's important. Now we want you to all come to the dark side, to the West Bay side, to attend the Gatsby Days Parade, which is the biggest parade, I believe, in the United States of revolutionary reenactment groups. Those fife and drum corps, those militia groups that work to march to the parade. We ourselves have been in the Bristol Parade. Uh, we were rowing a reenactment a rowboat uh, through Bristol Parade, but we were right in back of the Imperial Stormtroopers and right in front of Ronald McDonald. So we didn't get any attention <laughs> during the Bristol Parade whatsoever. But 
If you come to the Gatsby Day Parade, I think you'll enjoy it because uh, it really is a lot about history. Now, I'm going to start with a premise that everyone here is a history geek. Yeah. Is that pretty much right? <laughs> so you all know about the Gatsby and the burning of the Gatsby. So I'm going to run through sort of a quick overview of the burning of the Gatsby uh, so we can get into the conspiracy theory. And we're down, of course, uh, was started by Roger Williams, and but the charter gave unique rights, uh, mm -hmm. such as independent governance and freedoms of religion. And over the next 136 years, we became very independent of uh, the crown uh, commitments to what we they told us we should be doing. And of course, uh, we did have a whole lot of farmland and Narriessa Bay was, it still is, and I'm sure you guys would agree, the best feature of Rhode Island. And uh, unfortunately, as the tip of the uh, triangular trade, Rhode Island depended on the imports of uh, molasses to distill rum for imports. Um, but to pay for the cost of the American colonies during the French and Indian War, the crown and uh, you know imposed the uh, taxes such as the the tea tax, the township tax, and the stamp tax, and import duties remained on sugar and molasses. Uh, but by 1764, the British started to become serious about enforcing maritime trade laws. The Gatsby was one of uh, a fleet uh, of or what do we call it, not a fleet, we would probably call it a uh, class of warships that were bought, commissioned, built here in the United States and in Canada, uh, and commissioned the Royal Navy to stop smuggling along the American coast. It was sort of like a Coast Guard. These were li like the original Coast Guard cutters, and we all liked the Coast Guard. Uh, these people were not doing anything that bad, except they were mean to the colonists, the colonists didn't like them. Uh, but it greatly threatened the Rhode Island economy, which depended on the rum and molasses trade. Now John Brown, he was the uncle of Nicholas Brown, who gave the $5,000 to get Brown University named after him. He was the uncle. But he was the most successful merchant in Rhode Island at the time. Uh, very well diversified and he made a lot of money, uh, both as a merchant, distiller, shipbuilder, and along with many other businessmen, uh, that he was adversely affected by the presence of the Gatsby that was now enforcing the maritime law in Narragansett Bay. And as it turns out, John Brown was able to set a trap to destroy the Gatsby, and we'll see more about that. On June 9th, 1772, while chasing Hannah, one of John Brown's uh, ships, a sloop suspected of smuggling, the Gatsby ran aground on Warwick's Namquid Point, forever since called Gatsby Point. And uh, the Saturday Evening Post says that uh, the crew mooned that of the Gatsby, <laughs> saying, ha, 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 ha and proceeded on to Providence, uh, where the plight was promptly reported to John Brown, and a drummer was set up along the streets to gather support. Uh, colonial citizens met at the Sabin Tavern right, we have a marker there, but it's right near where Hemingway's restaurant is in downtown Providence now, if you go to see that place. But uh, that's where they planned to meet. And uh, the men, uh, well, the men uh, shot the commander of the Gatsby, uh, who was Lieutenant Tunnison, and captured the crew. They did not hurt the crew. They tied them up. They brought them into Tuxet Village. Uh, but then they burned the Gatsby. And that was a big thing back then, the destruction of a Royal Navy, Navy vessel. It was not just a custom schooner, it was a Royal Navy vessel. And so therefore it was an act of war. 
to be attacking that. Now, sizable rewards were offered by Colonial Governor uh, Wanton and by King George III that would have you been able to retire comfortably at that point uh, if you were 30 years old uh, just on those rewards alone had you decided. It was a total of 600 pounds sterling, which was an enormous amount of money back then when the average customs official back in 1772 was making about 30 pounds sterling a year. So that's an enormous amount of money. And they appointed a royal commission to investigate any people and would uh, threaten to send them over to England for, uh, for trial if caught. But Rhode Islanders were not in a cooperative mood uh, and they basically saw the show. And they never were able to find anybody or indict anybody. But the legacy of the Gatsby affair is not the burning of the ship. This is very important. It was the fact that the British colonial court that the, or the British court they established in the uh, colonies uh, bypassed the real courts in Rhode Island and denied the local citizens a uh, right to a trial by jury. This greatly alarmed the people, particularly in Virginia, who were doing the thinking at the time, uh, that this was an idea the British uh, attempted to subjugate uh, American citizens into a life of uh, just doing as the Crown's bidding. And it created a disaffection for the Crown by the people. Uh, and they decided to think about having independence from England. Stephen Park, a good friend of mine, uh, wrote in his book that it's hard to reproduce the, 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 the Commission of Inquiry did not present any good results. And it just really PO'd the citizens. So this disaffection led Rhode Island to uh, renounce the crown on May 4th, two months before the uh, Declaration of Independence. And some two months later, we did. Now, it did lead, the burning of the Gatsby did lead to the reestablishment of the Intercolonial Committees of Correspondence. And Thomas Jefferson wrote this in his diary. You can read the little letters about R.I. R. I. there. If this one works. Boom. Nope. Nope. Nope, that's all right. We don't need, we don't need a point. But you can see that Rhode Island is mentioned there in his handwriting. And this act, act helped unify political spheres of the 13 different colonies, which finally decided on the first Continental Congress and eventually to the Declaration of Independence. And Jefferson included the item uh, in the Declaration of Independence, three items that were directly attributable to the burning of the Gatsby. One of which is that he's combined to a foreign court that was out of our juris, not familiar to our jurisdiction and that uh, it limited our right to a trial by jury, and that uh, people were going to be transported across the seas for uh, these offenses. Now, realize if you were shipped over to England, you wouldn't be able to have defense uh, witnesses attend with you. You would no be totally lost in the British court system, and you'd probably be hung, drawn, and, or hang, drawn, and quartered for that. Neil Bunker, writing in The Empire on the Edge, blames Rhode Island as the start of the revolution for its uh, insurrectionist attitude. And it was well known that Sons of Liberty considered the burning of the Gatsby uh, a test case. And we have the Indians that the people uh, used at the Boston Tea Party. We had them here coming out of Bristol uh, well before that. So one can never argue the point of uh, which uh, the colonial fracas was most early, or the, the first shot fired. We're not talking about that. Because as John Adams said, the revolution was effected before the war commenced. The revolution was in the minds and hearts of the people. And that is very true. 
Sadly, the syllabus for the Gatsby Affair has been largely ignored because the historians and textbook authors were mainly out of Boston, and the Boston Tea Party was played up much bigger. In fact, Rhode Island forgot entirely about the centennial of the burning of the Gatsby and was called to task by the Chicago Tribune because they totally forgot about it. And so we made teacups uh, for the 1875 and 1876 uh, centennial of the United States celebrating the burning of the Gatsby, three years late. So that was something that was also repeated in 1922. The New York Times took us to task for also not celebrating the Gatsby very much. And that stopped because in 1976, the Gatsby Day Committee, uh, 1972, the Gatsby Day Committee held very large celebrations and has been holding larger and larger and larger celebrations each year since. Now, that's done. Everyone, that was a quick. That was a 15-minute overview with the Gatsby. Uh, any pertinent questions about that? Good. No. Okay, so next we're going to go on <laughs> to now the fun part. Historians have long assumed that this was just serendipity that the Gatsby ran aground. But what I'm going to be telling you here will show you that it was actually part of a well-developed conspiracy. Oh, no. <laughs> now, this picture of the screen by Edward Monk has to be talked about. He painted around the turn of the, cent the, turn of the last century and is one of the most famous 12 paintings in the world, according to what I looked up last night. But if you look at it, I want you to have a different point of view because I want you to take a different point of view to the burning of the Gatsby. Looks scared, right? But actually what this is is a beagle. See the ears? See the nose? <laughs> and I can prove it to you. This is my, <laughs> this is my late dog, Gatsby, who uh, was a beagle and looks just like her, doesn't it? <laughs> so when you see these threatening things of Edward Monk and the scream, it's, you can look at it at a different, different angle. Now, note that the attack on the Gatsby did not occur immediately after its appearance in the harbor. We had uh, several months, like five months, to prepare for the, uh, uh, its destruction. So it wasn't some suddenly unplanned knee-jerk response. Redown had four to five months to uh, prepare for it. Now, this is something that was found by Leonard Buckland, who was my good friend, historian uh, about the burning of the Gatsby. It turns out John Brown had, had run aground at Gatsby Point 12 years earlier with the exact same tide conditions and moon conditions that would later destroy the Gatsby. <coughs> and I had run aground on Gatsby Point. Uh, some of our state representatives have run aground on Gatsby Point. I won't name them, but... Uh, a lot of people have run aground on Gatsby Point. It's a treacherous point of land. You can't see it coming up uh, until you're, you've run aground. So it is treacherous. And John Brown knew about it. <coughs> and uh, this is an aerial view of Gatsby Point. You can see the sandbar uh, off to the north of the point. And you can see that if you were a ship coming this way, you'd never come across You'd never see that point, that sandbar, before you hit it. And that's the trap that trapped the Gatsby. And uh, the sandbar was just starting to recede by 3 p.m. when the Gatsby ran, uh, ran aground. This would effectively trap the Gatsby for the next 12 hours, if not the next, by calculations, the next 72 hours, because the next really high tide wouldn't come up uh, that probably released the Gatsby for a couple of days. And this left enough time for the Rhode Island colonists to assemble the attack that occurred. And uh, the attack occurred at 12.45 p.m. Uh, at 12.45 a.m. Most of these guys are going to be asleep. They're, they're not going to be doing it. They may have been out earlier in the day trying to drag the ship off, 
uh, or do other menial tasks. But once the uh, once 12:45 p.m. came around, there was no light, there was no TV, there was no hockey game to to look at or things like that. These guys were asleep, so it was a perfect time to attack. And the moon had just set, so that ensured tactical uh, tactical uh, darkness, which to cover the attack. And it was a Tuesday evening, so nobody was upset with it being the Sabbath. Uh, John Brown was assisted by several people that were stellar people uh, to help him. One was Abraham Whipple. This picture is uh, relegated to no other place than the US Naval Academy because of the honor that was bestowed him. Uh, this guy was a brilliant tactical commander, actually carried, uh, captured 10 British ships by ruse of pretending that he was a British ship, put ten, one person on each ship and brought them all into Boston Harbor. 10 ships at once. Sort of amazing. And how good do you have to be to appear in the color comics? I mean, that's really big stuff if you're in the color comics as a hero. That's a burning of the gas. All right, so second, besides Abraham Whipple, was John Brown's uh, older brother, Joseph Brown, who was an architect and a uh, natural philosopher. Uh, the term science, scientist wasn't coined until much later. But he was an architect and uh, a great mathematician. He was a member of the team that uh, took exacting measurements of the transit of Venus back in 1769, three years previously. <coughs> and his telescope is at Brown University, still on display. But he was definitely able to figure out the ties of the moon necessary to attack the Gatsby which is the data that I present next. This is what brought me on the whole thing, figuring out why did they attack when they did under the conditions they did. And we looked at uh, such sources as a Tidegraph app, which is an app for your telephone. Most of the Mariners probably know about it. It is a uh, application that'll present the exact high tide, low tide, at any one particular seat, uh, geographic location, with also the moon and sunset times and things like that. We also use data from NOAA and from the Navy Observatory. But uh, what we found was that the high tide was at 2.16 p.m. The Gatsby probably crossed the bar at about 3 p.m., so it was just waning high tide. So the sandbar was well hidden by the relatively high tide. The moon, the attack occurred about quarter of one. Well, the moon set was 1247 AM, so that's perfect. And it would have been uh, two in the morning at least uh, before that Gatsby was able to get off. But I, I think it wouldn't have been able to get off until the next day. So all the astronomical data agree with wit eyewitness Yep, all the uh, astronomical data uh, presented confirms the testimony by several eyewitnesses of the attack that were interviewed as far as the time. And this amounts to my next point that the tides of the moon were perfect for this and were only occur about 7% of the time in the next month. Would you have the ability to make an attack on a grounded gas, be keep it there, and have a hit a moon that would be dark for a successful attack. So it would have been a month before the next such conjunction occurred. And this obviously leads that it was probably planned in my view. The other thing we have is uh, the weather. It could have been stormy weather, but it wasn't. Ezra Stiles, who's a famous Newport uh, historian, uh, pastor of the church, I believe the Congregational Church, and he went on to become uh, one of the first presidents of Yale College 
Uh, but he did things like take exacting measurements of the uh, weather. And what we can see here is on June 9th, which is the days here. This is the 9th, this is the 10th. And this is at noon, and this is at 10 p.m. I believe it was 44 degrees, using the Franklin th Benjamin Franklin thermometer. Now, we don't know how accurate that was. It was probably warmer than that. But 44 is still not freezing cold. He was also measuring the length of hair of silkworms because they felt, for reasons that escaped me, that silkworms besaged whether you were going to have a long winter or a short winter. It was sort of like the Groundhog Day, which we just celebrated yesterday <laughs> or the day before yesterday. So uh, silkworms are no longer used. But anyway, it was a fair weather day. But also the Hannah, the ship that was chased up the point by the Gatsby, was just coming back from New York City. And as we mostly know, most of the bad weather, or most of the good weather, comes to us via New York City first, because that's due southwest of us. And most of the weather comes to the northeast. And so that if he was coming back from New York, he could bring uh, that the fact that the weather was good coming forth. Now the trap. Lieutenant Dennison was sailing in the unfamiliar waters of the upper Narragansett Bay. Now he usually had on board a pilot, a person who was very familiar with the ship, and, uh, very familiar with the surrounding waters that could guide the ship safely up the bay. Sylvanius uh, Daggett was one such person that was uh, a, a pilot, and he was in the employ of the Royal Navy until he got sent off a couple of weeks earlier. And he was led over to Nantucket to a sheep shearing, uh, where he was sheared, not the sheep. And his nose and ear were in much danger after that. Uh, it was sort of like being tarred and feathered. Uh, so the Gatsby had not previously traveled up to Narragansett Bay that far, and uh, this uh, lack of a pilot was a critical lapse of security because Dunningson, the commander of the Gatsby, didn't know where he was going. Dr. Abbas, who was supposed to come here tonight, uh, she was worried about the fire code violations, that there were too many people in the room, so she said she would not come. But uh, she did a lot of research. She's a, a head of the Rhode Island Merit, uh, Marine Archaeology Project. Had done research at the Brown University Libraries and found that uh, references in John Brown's papers that he had been carrying large sums of money and gold on the Hannah in the previous weeks uh, leading up to its destruction uh, or the Gatsby's destruction. And so Lieutenant Denson was no fool. I'm sure he had people out and about and letting uh, the Lieutenant Denson know that there was a lot of money there to be had. Uh, and this gave him extra incentive to attack the Gatsby. So what's more is that the Hanna did not follow uh, nautical custom to lower its flag in front of a British warship. And that was deliberately insulting as it passed by from Newport through the Straits, going up Narragansett Bay. He deliberately did not lower his flag and <laughs> talk about being PO'd. The uh, chase was on. That was a deliberate insult. Now, the commander of the Hannah, the ship that was being chased with the gas, he was one Benjamin Lindsay, who had been doing this packet uh, route or packet being a, a sort of a shipping and passenger combination route between Providence, Newport, and New York for nine years. So he knew Gatsby Days, or Ga the Gatsby Bay, or Narragansett Bay, very, very well. And uh, he was, knew every crook and nanny of, of Narragansett Bay. The Hannah was a coastal transport, had a relatively sh short draft called a shallop. I was able to get in close into uh, smuggler's dens, uh, into the land, into where you'd want to offload your cargo. 
so the British wouldn't find it. The Gatsby, on the other hand, was, had a deeper draft. It was necessary to go out and patrol uh, George's Bank and the fishing areas out in the Atlantic. Some of these ships actually crossed the Atlantic, although the Gatsby, to our knowledge, had not. Mostly it was based in Halifax, Boston, Philadelphia, and Providence. But as the chase arrived up at uh, Namquid Point, the shallow draft of the Hanna allowed it to come right across, whereas the Gatsby would not. Now the Hanna crossed the point right over here, and then went over to the left and sort of furled its sails like it was confused. The Gatsby saw that and went straight on in and got grounded. So that's from the eyewitness accounts we have. So, uh, Dennison was hell bent on catching his prey and went hard to ground. The crew of the Hannah, as we say, insulted that of the helpless schooner. Uh, their usual dock, rather conveniently, was right across from uh, Sabin's Tavern where they, the final plans were made. Now, that is, again, where the restaurants were in Providence now, the water went one street up, and Canal Street was, and Water Street was built on where there was water, but it got filled in over time. So subtract one street from the current Providence River uh, Basin to make up for what was in 1772. Uh, but once the word of the trap Gatsby was up, uh, they tried to drum up support. Sick. And was, it was a uh, militia training day. Businesses closed. Meetings were canceled. And uh, at least some of these men came from the nearby ships at Fox Point. John Brown and his compatriots had shipbuilding yards in Fox Point and other places uh, about Narragansett Bay. And uh, so these men were young men, a lot of teenagers, were shipbuilding apprentices and were able to come over and join in the attack, either because voluntarily or under the direct orders of John Brown. Either way, it's pretty remarkable they got 64 people to join in the attack, and all of which would have been hung if caught and no one could conclusively identify them after they got away with it. So John Brown also had time to coordinate this raid with uh, people from uh, more subtly parts of the Narragansett Bay, particularly Bristol and, and uh, Warren, which had the time to at least man one boat in a coordinated attack at the same time. How do we know this? Ezra Ormsby, uh, in about 1832, his widow was a, uh, reapplying for a pension from the, uh, for her late husband's uh, service in the revolution. And she names here, I can't make this up, but you can just make out the names of these people from the uh, East Bay side. There was Captain John Greenwood. There was Joshua Smith, Abner Luther, Abel Easterbrooks, Nathaniel Easterbrooks, Ezekiel Kinnicutt, and myself, Ezra Ormsby, all went over in the boat uh, from Bristol, the Bristol area, to attack the Gatsby. The map of the whole area shows that if you leave the warm confines of Bristol Harbor, which is right here, and follow the green line. <laughs> All right, follow the green line. And that is the boat from Bristol coming up to attack. Now, we have it going there, but he also met up with a person from Prudence Island, which is part of Portsmouth. This was. Uh, This was uh, Simeon, Simeon Potter was the captain of the boat, and he picked up Aaron Briggs, a young slave of half African-American, half Native 
American blood from Prudence Island. Why would he do that? Well, he'd planned it because he stopped by a week before, according to Aaron Briggs, and talked to his master. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, Potter had stopped by a week before to uh, pick up, uh, to, to check out Briggs. And after the attack, the wounded Lieutenant Dennison was deliberately placed next in the boat to Aaron Briggs as they rowed him from the burning or the uh, Gatsby to Patuxent Village. Why would they have done that? Nah. They, that was to point out that this was done by Narragansett Indians, not by people from Providence, God forbid. It would only be to do that. Now, at some point, John Brown owned la large tracts of land on Prudence Island called Sweet Farm. I'm not familiar with that particularly. Uh, and at uh, Sandy Point. Now, I went, to Sa I went here. I came here a couple hours early, and I went down to Sandy Point. I brought a rock from Sandy Point. I was so impressed. Sandy Point rock. Because it's exactly like Gatsby Point. It really is. But did you know that Sandy Point was also a point where Revolutionary War ships were built under the auspices of John Brown and his compatriots? Sandy Point is 3.8 miles down south from here. If you haven't been to Sandy Point, you've got to go to Sandy Point. And just sit there and think about it. It's a beautiful piece of land, and you can really see the bay from there. Uh, Prudence Island, I didn't go over to, but uh, this piece of paper, I have a hard time reading uh, deeds, but this was out of a deed from John Brown's papers, uh, the Sweet Farm and Sandy Point. It turns out it's very difficult to read. My wife, however, is a real estate title examiner. And she is used to reading all sorts of garbage, <laughs> terrible handwriting, and municipal documents. And so she read it out loud to me. And I translated it into what I thought was English. But I'm a doctor. I can't read my own handwriting in this. <laughs> so it's difficult. But I can say that. The Wanton Farm was 520 acres. There were 380 acres at Sweet Farms. There were another 320 acres at Sandy Point. 320 acres at Sandy Point. How big a lot of land is that? That's enormous. That's big enough for a shipyard. And there's no other reason for him to have it there. And the land on Prudence Island was also uh, part of uh, part of the waterfront. So it's likely you Portsmouth historians, if you go back there, that you can find some more stuff. It also talks about 6,000 acres in Surville, in the township of Surville. We couldn't find the township of Surville. People in Burville don't even remember the township of Surville, but it used to be a town in, Port in uh, Burville. That's probably where he got his lumber for his ships. So be it. So John Brown was up to a lot of things. He was well diversified. He was well into shipbuilding, into spermaceti candles, which burned brighter and cleaner than regular wax candles. Uh, he was into the ironworks and making cannon. He made a lot of cannons for a lot of the ships in the Revolutionary War, mainly at his Hope Foundry, but also at other foundries uh, throughout the state. Now, the Sons of Liberty were also part of this whole plot. This is where it really becomes uh, part of a conspiracy. Uh, Sons of Liberty, as we all know, were loosely organized resistance. Sometimes, even the, you know, they talk about uh, scams from Narragansett uh, Electric or from National Grid saying, hey, give me your money, you know, I'm from National Grid. Well, people, back in 1772 era, 
Sons of Liberty would be real, they might be fake. They might be just trying to get you money, so you gotta be careful. Anyway, the Sons of Liberty that were real quickly spread throughout the colonies and included mostly publishers and lawyers <coughs> who tended to control the rowdiness of the groups that were doing the tarring and feathering, uh, but it included Sam Adams. And after the repeal of the Stamp Act, they held very many celebratory reunions. They would reenact and celebrate or commemorate, not celebrate, commemorate the uh, Boston Massacre every year. Which brings up another point that I must digress on. Uh, March 5th, March 7th actually, <coughs> in Boston, they're celebrating the 250th anniversary of the uh, Boston Massacre. They're not celebrating it, they're commemorating it. But it will be the 250th Boston Massacre. So we're coming up to a lot of celebratory events coming up. Okay, so Sam Adams was a well-known leader throughout. He went on to become one of the most influential people in the First and Second Continental Congresses uh, and advocate for independence from Great Britain. But the attack on British interests such as this revenue scooter would have been, you know, putting for him the perfect target. Uh, it can, the gas we represented the continued taxation and oppression by the British against Americans. As the motives of the attack by Redowns, there was not likely some sudden ill thought uh, out attack because John Brown, Abraham Whipple, and the others of the team undoubtedly foresaw that the British would react to any attack by filling their against the bay with British ships and stranglehold their enterprises, which is exactly what happened. They sent the Rose, but before they sent the Rose, they also sent many other ships the following year to just put a stranglehold on American shipping within Narragansett Bay. Now, immediately following the announcement that they were holding a court of inquiry uh, about the burning of the Gatsby in Newport, because they thought it was Newport, they didn't realize it was closer to Providence. They thought Newport was a closer point. Uh, but they sought urgent advice from Sam Adams. Darius Sessions, who was lieutenant, well, back then it was a deputy governor, but now referred to as a lieutenant governor. Stephen Hopkins, who was chief uh, court of the, uh, chief justice of the Superior Court, there was no Supreme Court back then. So he was a head honcho as far as legal in Rhode Island. John Cole, who was a former uh, uh, chief court justice. And um, Moses Brown, the brother of John Brown, were all wrote to Sam Adams for advice. And we can say that Deputy uh, Governor Sessions deliberately obfuscated the uh, investigation of the commission. Stephen uh, Hopkins refused outright to send anybody indicted by the commission to British custody. Uh, former Chief Justice Cole outright lied to the commission saying that he never knew nothing Never saw nothing, and Moses Brown was a brother. So why did these prominent Rhode Island citizens bother to consult with a rabble rouser from Massachusetts at all? Why? Sam Adams was more influential than we knew. And Adams expressed no surprise about the whole thing. The Sons of Liberty were indeed more active in 1772 than most people have surmised. We knew they were active in 1764 during the Stamp Acts. We knew they were active in 1776 during the times immediately leading up to the uh, Declaration of Independence. But they were also active throughout those years in between. And in 1772, they burnt the Caspi. But unfortunately, John Adam, I mean, uh, Sam Adams is recorded by historians as ripping up his papers relating to the uh, anything about the Sons of Liberty, because he knew that the, if the British found them, they would hang them all. And there was uh, trunk loads of paper that he had rip up or burn and destroy. So we have nothing of value for the historians to be able to look through about what Sam Adams actually did or said. But why would these guys from Rhode Island bother writing to Sam Adams? Why? 
There's no good reason for that unless they're reporting to their superior officer or superior. And it's well known that the uh, Sons of Liberty regarded the Gatsby as a test case before they dumped tea in the harbor. We also have some, oh, this is sick, uh, hard evidence, but we have a stone that's now in the Patuxent Armory uh, of related to the burning of the Gatsby as being from the Sons of Liberty. This is where the Sabre Tavern was when that was torn down. In the 1900s, it was replaced and then replaced by what is now, then the IBM building, but now it's, uh, it's, so it's uh, another courthouse offices of the, of the court. So uh, whether it was HMS Gatsby or HRM Gatsby, it doesn't matter. It's the schooner Gatsby. And we also have some local intelligence. Admiral Montague, who was commander of the fleet in the Northeast for the British, was, had been informed that people were uh, talking about burning or getting rid of the Gatsby. And he threatened to hang anybody so involved as pirates. And Charles Dudley, who was a uh, tax collector, said after the fact that, yeah, this was thought of long in advance. And uh, evidence would not be uh, wanting, but he also knew that uh, Rhode Island courts would not go along with indicting anybody. So he proffered that uh, you want to have it uh, someplace else besides Rhode Island if you're going to have a court of inquiry. So in summary, John Brown and his compatriots had a unique motive to conduct the attack experience, geography, and timing to conduct the attack, strategic input and approval by the Sons of Liberty, logistic capabilities of his empire, tactical brilliance and planning of the sea captains, superb intelligence of his network, and diversification of his assets across a wide range of things. He owned fishing fleets in Nantucket. He owned the shipbuilding industries. He owned cannon foundries. He owned the Spermacity Candle Works. He was well diversified. Textron is a conglomerate. Now we're all used to the word conglomerate. Textron is Bell Helicopters. What was it? it was, they had power mowers. They had a mana refrigerators, I think. They're a conglomerate. There's a wide range of different things. And John Brown was the original guy who was a conglomerate and be able to withstand all these things, uh, such as British uh, taking over the bay. So given the preponderance of evidence, uh, we think the Gatsby was planned to be burned several weeks beforehand. The evidence cannot be underestimated because it was America's first blow for freedom. So with that, I am willing to take questions. Yes, yes ma'am. On the why on the tombstone uh, towards the end there, did it say the first bloodshed? I didn't think that was bloodshed. Well, uh, someone tried, uh, Lieutenant Dennis did, in the groin, but it was just above his groin, and a surgeon, a medical student was there that was well trained, able to save him. And uh, Lieutenant Dennison went on to father four children, so it didn't hurt him too much, I guess. <laughs> After recovering at a French spa, he uh, yeah he did okay by himself. He went on to become an admiral, actually, yeah. rear admiral. I forgot from the book that he said he would rather die than. Uh, than yeah, he know. would he would not talk to uh, Lieutenant or Deputy Governor Sessions because he wanted to save his deposition, deposition for the uh, admiral that was the recommender. Which was the correct military thing to do? Yes, sir. How, how far was it from? Sabin's Tavern to Gatsby Point. Six miles. So any idea how long it took them to row down? They were rowing, uh, I, I believe. I know it was uh, pretty common back then to row like. 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. They were rowing in sort of a neutral current. Uh, t you know, it would probably take them an hour to get down. Probably meet up with a boat from Bristol and talk to the village. And then go out and attack the Gatsby at 12.45. Probably have a few beers first. Uh, we do, do know that they picked up, 
uh, <laughs> some paving stones and barrel staves at uh, uh, at the shore along the way, you know, just for fun, so they would have. But somebody brought along a gun too. What, why did they shoot? Um, it was a young teenager, Joseph Buckland. He was 19 years old. He it wasn't his gun; it was his friend's gun that came along, and these. Uh, eight or nine boats that were each commanded by a ship captain were in relatively good control. During the Revolutionary War era, uh, there were mobs, but the mobs were always well controlled by, by higher ups. And just mob action. You had a captain in charge of each boat. I don't know why the captain didn't stop him from shooting. But the intent was not to really shoot anybody. It was to take over the gas tank and burn it. Uh, but he got shot nonetheless. And, but he did survive. And they took good care of him afterwards. They brought him down to low deck. They tended to his wounds as best they could. The ball had actually split in half. Half the ball went down to his groin and was taken out by the surgeon. The other half of the ball was in his arm and stayed in his arm for the rest of his life. And I'll always point to that. He Didn't stood you bring him to Newport? Place. Some doctor? Well, uh, after doctor? he was uh, stayed at in uh, Texas Village for a few days, uh, just after he got shot, he was brought, brought down to his lawyer's house in Newport. Uh, Brayton's Point. Uh, uh, it was a Brayton guy. Hence, Brayton's Point in Newport, part of that family. And then he went over to Europe to a French spa to recuperate for uh, a few months on the Royal Navy uh, dole. Yes, ma'am. You had a question? I don't know where I picked up the uh, idea, but there was a lot more drama uh, when Moses Brown was home mm -hmm. off to Boston. He was darn near um, going to be shipped to England to be hanged. Yeah, John Brown was arrested later on by uh, Admiral uh, Gates or, or, or General Gates of the British occupying force in Boston for carrying flour into Boston uh, to help feed the Patriots. And for that he was put in jail. And his brother Moses uh, Brown went up to Boston and uh, negotiated his, re his return. Now during that time, as it turns out, there was actually motions by the Americans to set up uh, some uh, ships from Plymouth to rescue John Brown as he was being as he was being carried on a ship from uh, Narragansett Bay up to Boston, which would have started the revolution right there had they done that, but they were not able to uh, meet up with each other. So, yes, sir. Yeah, n not a question, but I want to say thank you for being exact when you identified May the 4th and the action taken by the Rhode Island Assembly was to disavow our allegiance to the Crown. Yes. We did not declare our independence on that date. It's a missed distinction, so thank you. With words. We were declaring independence, I think, in, in actuality, but yeah, they did not say that. But uh, you're right, I was trying to be careful. <laughs> and you were, you succeeded. Yeah. Okay. Now I wanted to also tell you how much I love Portsmouth. So I said I came down here a couple hours beforehand, and I went down to Sandy Point. You gotta visit that place. It's, it's a beach, it's a rocky beach, but it's nice. And you, you can really think out loud there. And I came back, so we're looking for a martini. It's hard to find a martini on East Main Road. That really is. So I finally ended up, or my GPS, and I ended up at Tremblay's. Finally got my martini. But I was, you know, quite a bit north by then, by the time I got there. You gotta have more martini bars here. <laughs> How did you miss but Fieldstone? You, you went right by Fieldstone. Oh yeah, there are a lot of Fieldstones on the way to Sandy Point. There's a restaurant. There's a bar. Oh, Fieldstones? Oh, I didn't, didn't come across that. You know, you have your restaurants 
too well camouflaged for the British, so they wouldn't bother. <laughs> no doubt. Anything else? <coughs> well, thank you for attending. I'm really honored. Thank you. Portsmouth Historical Society is a volunteer nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation and interpretation of Portsmouth, Rhode Island history. Our long-term vision is to protect and promote Portsmouth's cultural heritage by creating a secure and sustainable facility where, in conjunction with other local organizations, we can store, maintain, and display our collection of historic artifacts offer lecture and research assistance to the public, and stimulate the study of our town's history for future generations. We strongly believe that the uniqueness of Portsmouth today is defined by our past. The Society fulfills its mission by maintaining and providing tours of the historical buildings in its possession, collecting, conserving, and interpreting historical documents and objects linked to the historical sites, houses, farms, and families of Portsmouth, providing direction and resources to assist genealogical and scholarly research related to Portsmouth history, arranging exhibitions which use historical materials to enrich the public's understanding and appreciation of Portsmouth's rich history, and presenting programs on topics that build enthusiasm for preserving and supporting our local history. We hope you are a member of our society. If not, would you like to become a member? We welcome your help and support. Please go to our website, www.portsmouthhistorical.org, to see how you be can become a member or help our society. Our museum is at 870 East Main Road in Portsmouth at Union Street. Our museum will be open every Sunday afternoon for all visitors from Memorial Day weekend until Columbus Day weekend. If you have a group that wants to tour the museum, please contact us and we can make special arrangements. <laughs>